Now we are taking you to a part of history that you may not have heard yet and you will be very happy to know and you will also feel very good that a thousand years ago in our world. What happened in which region of the world and what kind of kings were there who treated their people during their time? So to know all this in our video, you must watch the video till the end, then start without wasting time. Let's go to Aja's interesting and informative video. Edward the Black Prince Edward of Woodstock, June 15, 1330 to June 8, 1376, also known as the Black Prince, was the eldest son and heir presumptive of King Edward III of England. He died before his father, thus his son, Richard II, took the crown instead. Nonetheless, Edward distinguished himself as one of the most effective English commanders during the Hundred Years' War, and his English contemporaries considered him as a model of chivalry and one of the best knights of his time. In 1337, Edward was appointed Duke of Cornwall, becoming the first English dukedom. In 1338, 1340, in 1342, he served as the kingdom's guardian while his father was absent. He was made Prince of Wales in 1343 and knighted by his father at La Hogue in 1346. In 1346, Prince Edward led the vanguard at the Battle of Cressy with his father purposefully leaving him to win. He participated in Edward III's 1349 Calais campaign. In 1355, he was named the king's lieutenant in Gascony and tasked with leading an army into Aquitaine on a chevachi, during which he pillaged a vignanet and castle notary, sacked Carcassonne, and looted Narbonne. In 1356, on another Chevachi, he destroyed Auvergne, Lamousin, and Berry but failed to capture Bourges. He presented peace negotiations to King John II of France, who had outflanked him in Poitiers, but refused to sacrifice himself as a condition for acceptance. This resulted to the Battle of Poitiers, where his army defeated the French and imprisoned King John. The year following Poitiers, Edward returned to England. In 1360, he negotiated the Treaty of Bertigny. In 1362, he was made Prince of Aquitaine and Gascony, but the Lord of Albret and other Gascon lords refused to accept his authority. In 1364, his father ordered him to stop the roving raids of the English and Gascon Free Companies. He reached an agreement with Kings Peter of Castile and Charles II of Navarre, in which Peter agreed to mortgage Castro Erdiels and the province of Biscay to him as collateral for a loan. In 1366, a passage was secured through Navarre. In 1367, Peter's half-brother and competitor, Henry of Trastamer, sent him a letter of defiance. He defeated Henry at the Battle of Nehera the same year, following a protracted fight. However, after several months of waiting and failing to gain either the province of Biscay or the clearance of Don Pedro's debt, he returned to Aquitaine. In 1368, Prince Edward persuaded the estates of Aquitaine to accept him a five-year hearth tax of ten sous. This alienates the Lord of Albret and other nobility. Prince Edward returned to England in 1371 and resigned as Prince of Aquitaine and Gascony the following year. He spearheaded the commons' attack on the Lancastrian rule in 1376. He died of illness in 1376 and was buried at Canterbury Cathedral, which still houses his surcoat, helmet, shield, and gauntlets. Early Life, 1330-1343 Edward, the eldest son of Edward III of England, Lord of Ireland and ruler of Gascony, and Queen Philippa was born on June 15, 1330, in Woodstock, Oxfordshire. 
His father, Edward III, was in struggle with the French for English possessions in France, as well as the monarchy of France. Queen Isabella of France, Edward III's mother and the prince's grandmother, was the daughter of French King Philip IV, putting her son in line for the French throne. England and France's relations swiftly worsened when the French king threatened to seize his holdings in France, sparking the Hundred Years' War. His mother was Queen Philippa of Hainaut, daughter of the Count of Hainaut, and she married Edward III after his mother, Queen Isabella, arranged their marriage. On September 10, 1330, his father allowed 500 marks per year from the revenues of the County of Chester for his upkeep on February 25, 1331. The entire amount of these profits was assigned to the Queen for his maintenance. And the King's sister, Eleanor. In July of that year, the King intended to marry him to the daughter of Philip VI of France. His father was Edward III of England, who became king at the age of 14 in 1327 after his father and the Black Prince's grandfather, Edward II of England, was deposed by his wife, Isabella of France. Daughter of Philip IV of France and the English nobility due to his inability and weakness to assert his control over the government and his failed wars against Scotland. His mother, Philippa of Hainaut, was the daughter of William II, Count of Hainaut. His grandmother, Isabella of France, arranged the marriage of his mother and father. To seek financial and military assistance from the Count of Hainaut in order to remove her husband, Edward II. Edward III and Philippa of Hainaut had thirteen children. Edward was the eldest child and son. His father had initiated a war with Scotland to reclaim lost territory seized by the Scots during Edward II's reign, as well as the military actions performed by Edward III's grandfather, Edward I of England, who reclaimed English holdings such as Berwick upon Tweed. Edward III used his grandfather's military ideas and tactics against the Scots to avenge the humiliating defeat of the English under Edward II at the Battle of Bannockburn in 1314. This time, Edward III defeated the Scots at the crucial Battle of Halidon Hill in 1333, killing many Scottish lords and routing their whole army. Edward III was able to reclaim the land both politically and militarily, and he was hailed as a great champion of the English nation. On March 18, 1333, Edward was invested with the earldom and county of Chester, and on February 9, 1337, he was created Duke of Cornwall and granted the duchy by charter dated March 17. This is the first instance of the creation of a duke in England. According to the charter, the duchy would be held by him and the eldest sons of the kings of England. His teacher was Dr. Walter Burley of Merton College in Oxford. In March 1334, his profits were made available to his mother to cover the costs of raising him and his two sisters, Isabella and Joan. In August 1335, rumors of an impending French invasion prompted the king to order that he and his household relocate to Nottingham Castle for safety. When two cardinals arrived in England at the end of 1337 to broker peace between Edward III and Philip VI of France, the Duke of Cornwall is supposed to have met them outside the city of London. And, along with numerous nobility, to have led them to King Edward. On July 11, 1338, his father, who was about to leave England for Flanders, appointed him guardian of the kingdom during his absence, and he was reappointed to the same office on May 27, 1340 and October 6, 1342. He was, of course, too young to play more than a minor role in the administration, which was handled by the council. 
To connect Duke John III of Brabant to his cause, the king in 1339 offered a marriage between the young Duke of Cornwall and John's daughter Margaret, and in the spring of 1345, he wrote hurriedly to Pope Clement VI seeking a dispensation for the marriage. On May 12, 1343, Edward III established the Duke of Wales in a Westminster Parliament, bestowing upon him a circlet, gold ring, and silver rod. On July 3, 1345, the prince followed his father to Sluis, where the king attempted to persuade the burgomasters of Ghent, Bruges, and Ypres to recognize his son as their lord, but Jacob van Artevelde's murder put an end to this scheme. Both in September and the following April, the prince was called on to contribute troops from his principality and earldom for the impending campaign in France, and because he accumulated huge debts in the king's service. His father authorized him to make his will and provided that, in the event that he died in battle, his executors should be entitled to all of his earnings for one year. Early Campaigns 1346-53 Battle of Cressy On July 11, 1346, Edward, Prince of Wales, embarked with King Edward III and was knighted by his father at the local church of Kethau as soon as he arrived in Lahug. Then he made a right good beginning, for he rode through the Codenton, burning and ravaging as he went, and distinguished himself at the capture of Cannes and the engagement with the force led by Sir Godmar I du Fay, which attempted to prevent the English army from crossing the Somme by the Blanche attack ford. On July 11, 1346, Edward, Prince of Wales, embarked with King Edward III and was knighted by his father at the local church of Kethau as soon as he arrived in La Hook. Then he made a right good beginning, for he rode through the Codenton, burning and ravaging as he went, and distinguished himself at the capture of Cannes and the engagement with the force led by Sir Godmar I du Fay, which attempted to prevent the English army from crossing the Somme by the Blanche attack ford. Early on Saturday, August 26, 1346, before the opening of the Battle of Cressy, Edward, Prince of Wales, received the sacrament with his father in Cressy. He took charge of the army's right, or van, alongside the Earls of Warwick and Oxford, Sir Geoffrey D. Harcourt, Sir John Chandos, and other officers leading 800 men-at-arms, 2,000 archers, and 1,000 Welshfoot. However, the figures are far from reliable. When the Genoese bowmen were upset and the French front line was in disarray, the prince appears to have departed his position to attack their second line. At this time, however, the Count of Alassar rushed his division with such ferocity that he was in serious danger, and the commanders who led with him dispatched a messenger to inform his father that he was in dire straits and to beg for assistance. When Edward realized that his son was not injured, he decided not to send any support because he wanted to give the prince the opportunity to win his spurs. He was already a knight and give him and those in charge of him the honor of victory. The prince was thrown to the ground and rescued by his standard bearer, Sir Richard Fitzsimon, who threw down the banner, stood over his body, and fought back his attackers while he regained his feet. Harcourt immediately sought assistance from the Earl of Arundel, and he drove back the French, who had most likely pushed to the English position's rising ground. A flank attack on the side of Watacourt was subsequently undertaken by the Counts of Alassa and Ponthieu, but the English were solidly. Entrenched there, and the French were unable to overcome the fortifications and lost the Duke of Lorraine and the Counts of Alassa and Blois. Their army's two front lines were completely smashed before King Philip's division engaged. Then Edward appears to have rushed to the head of the reserve and the rout was soon complete. 
When Edward met his son after the battle, he embraced him and proclaimed that he had faithfully acquitted himself, and the prince knelt down and revered his father. The next day, he joined the king in honoring King John of Bohemia's funeral. The prince was present at the Siege of Calais, 1346-1347, and after the town's surrender, he ravaged and burned the region for 30 miles, 48 kilometers around, returning with much booty. 27. He returned to England with his father on October 12, 1347, took part in the justs and other festivals of the court, and was invested by the king with the new order of the garter, 1348. Siege of Calais and Battle of Winchelsea. Prince Edward participated in the king's march to Calais in the latter days of 1349, came to his father's rescue and when the battle was done and the king. Once his prisoners sat down to feast, he and the other English knights served the king and his guests at the first course before moving on to another table for the second course. When the king embarked at Winchelsea on August 28, 1350, to intercept the fleet of La Cerda, the prince accompanied him, albeit on a different ship and with his brother, the infant John of Gaunt, Earl of Richmond. During the Battle of Winchelsea, his ship was gripped by a large Spanish ship and was so full of leaks that it was likely to drown. Despite his and his knights' valiant efforts, they were unable to capture her. Henry of Gromont, Earl of Lancaster, rushed to his assistance and attacked the Spaniard on the other side. She was soon taken, her crew were thrown into the sea, and as the prince and his men clambered on board her, their own ship foundered. Cheshire Expedition In 1353, some disturbances appear to have broken out in Cheshire as the prince, as Earl of Chester, marched with Henry of Gromont, now Duke of Lancaster, to the vicinity of Chester to support the justices who were holding an assize there. The men of the earldom volunteered to pay him a substantial fee to bring the assize to an end, but when they believed they had resolved matters, the justices launched an inquisition at Trailbaston. They took a significant number of money from them and seized several buildings and a large amount of land for the prince, who was their lord. On his return from Chester, the prince is said to have passed by the Abbey of Diulikers in Staffordshire to have seen a fine church that his great-grandfather, Edward I, had built there and to have granted 500 marks. A tenth of the sum he had taken from his earldom toward its completion, the abbey was almost certainly not Diulikers but Vale additional royal campaigns 1355-64. Aquitaine When Edward III decided to continue the war with France in 1355, he ordered the Black Prince to lead an army into Aquitaine while he, as planned, cooperated with the King of Navarre in Normandy. The Duke of Lancaster supported John of Montfort in Brittany. The prince's expedition was organized at the request of certain Gascon lords seeking booty. On July 10th, the king designated him his lieutenant in Gascony, giving him the authority to act in his place and, on August 4th, to receive homages. He left London for Plymouth on June 30th, was detained there by contrary winds, and set sail on September 8th with around 300 ships, in company with four earls, Thomas Beecham, Earl of Warwick, William Euford, Earl of Suffolk, William Montague, Earl of Salisbury, and John Vere, Earl of Oxford, and in command of a thousand men-at-arms, two thousand archers. A big body of Welsh foot. A.T. Bordeaux, the Gascon nobles greeted him with joy. It was decided to conduct a little expedition before the winter, and on October 10th, he went out with 1,500 lances, 2,000 archers, and 3,000 lightfoot. Whatever plan the king devised over the summer, the prince's trip was entirely raiding. 
After severely harrying the counties of Juliac, Armagnac, Astarac, and a portion of Cominges, he crossed the Garonne at St. Marie a little beyond Toulouse, which was occupied by John I, Count of Armagnac, with a large force. The Count refused to allow the garrison to make a sally, and the Prince continued into the Lorigais. His forces stormed and burned Moncasgard, where many men, women, and children were ill-treated and killed, and then pillaged a vignette and castle notary. According to the Black Prince, the country was very rich and fertile, and the people were good, simple, and ignorant of war, so the Prince took considerable booty, particularly carpets, draperies, and diamonds, because the robbers spared nothing. And the Gascons who marched with him were especially greedy. Monkey was the lone stronghold that resisted the English forces. The Chatelaine defended its walls by spilling beehives on the assailants, who fled in terror. Carcassonne was captured and sacked, but not the citadel which was strategically located and protected. Orms or Homps near Narbonne and Trebs purchased his army. He ravaged Narbonne and considered attacking the castle because he had heard there was a lot of booty inside, but he abandoned the plan after seeing it was well defended. While he was there, a courier from the papal court approached him and urged him to allow peace negotiations. He said he couldn't do anything without knowing his father's will. From Narbonne, he marched back to Bordeaux. The Count of Armagnac attempted to stop him, but after a small French force was beaten in a skirmish near Toulouse, the rest of the army withdrew into the city, and the prince returned to Bordeaux in peace, carrying vast riches with him. The voyage lasted eight weeks, during which time the prince only rested for eleven days in each location he visited, and he caused great havoc for the French monarch without executing any military feat during the following month, before January 21, 1356. The leaders under his direction demolished five towns and seventeen castles. Battle of Poitiers Battle of Poitiers according to the Grandes Chroniques de France. On July 6, 1356, Prince Edward embarked on another journey with the purpose of crossing across France to Normandy and assisting his father's Norman allies, led by the King of Navarre and Geoffrey de Harcourt. In Normandy, he anticipated to meet his father. On August 4th, he crossed the Dordogne at Bergerac and rode through Auvergne, Limousin, and Barry, robbing and destroying as he went until he arrived in Bourges, where he burned the suburbs but failed to capture the city. He then headed west and launched a fruitless attack on Asudan on August 25th to 27th. Meanwhile, King John II was gathering a huge army at Chartres from which he could defend the Loire crossings as well as dispatching troops to fortresses that appeared to be under siege. From Asudan, the prince resumed his march and captured Vierzon. There, he discovered that it was impossible for him to cross the Loire or establish a link with Lancaster, who was then in Brittany. As a result, he decided to return to Bordeaux via Poitiers, and after killing the majority of the garrison at Vierzon Castle, he set out for Romorantin on August 29th. Some French knights who had fought with the English advanced guard escaped into Romorantin, and when Prince Edward learned of this, he replied, Let us go there. I'd like to see them a little closer. He visited the stronghold personally and dispatched his companion Chandos to summon the garrison to surrender. Boussicault and other leaders defended the location and when they refused his summons, he assaulted it on August 31st. The siege took three days and the prince, who was furious by the loss of one of his buddies, declared that he would not leave the location unoccupied. Finally, he set fire to the fortress's roofs with Greek fire, reducing it on September 3rd. On September 5th, the English began to march through Barry. 
On September 9th, King John II, who had gathered a huge force, crossed the Loire at Blois to pursue them. When the king arrived in Lox on September 12th, he had up to 20,000 men at arms and he moved to Chauvigny with these and additional forces. On September 16th and 17th, his army crossed the Vienne. Meanwhile, the prince was marching practically parallel with the French dot and only a few miles away from them. It is impossible to believe Froissart's claim that he was unaware of French movements. From 14 to September 16th, he stayed at Châtellerault, and on the next day, Saturday, as he was advancing towards Poitiers, some French men-at-arms skirmished with his advance guard, chased them up to the main body of his army, and were all slaughtered or taken prisoners. The French king had outpaced him, and his withdrawal was cut up by an army of at least 50,000 soldiers, despite having only roughly 2,000 men-at-arms for 1,000 archers and 1,500 lightfoot. Lancaster had attempted to come to his assistance. However, the French stopped them at Pontesu. When Prince Edward realized that the French army was between him and Poitiers, he took up position on some rising ground to the southeast of the city, between the right bank of the Miausen and the old Roman road, most likely on a spot now known as La Cardenerie, a farm in the commune of Beauvoir, as the name Maupertuis has long been out of use and remained there that night. The next day, Sunday, September 18th, the Cardinal Healy Talleyrand, known as of Paragor, got permission from King John II to try to make peace. The prince was willing to come to terms, offering to give up all of the towns. The castles he had taken to release all of his hostages and not to serve against the King of France for seven years, in addition to paying a reward of 100,000 francs. However, King John was convinced to demand that the prince and a hundred of his knights surrender as prisoners, which he refused. The cardinal's negotiations lasted all day and were delayed in the advantage of the French, as John II wanted to allow time for further reinforcements to join his army. Given the prince's position at the time, it appears likely that the French could have killed his little army simply by encircling it with a fraction of their host. As a result, it was either starved or forced to leave its stronghold and battle in the open, knowing it would be defeated. John II made a grave blunder by giving the prince Sunday off. While the negotiations were ongoing, he used his army to bolster its position. The English front was well covered in vines and hedges. To its left and rear was the Miausen Ravine and a lot of broken land, and to its right was the wood and abbey of Nwail. The troops was busy digging trenches and building fences all day, so it was like an entrenched camp, similar to Cressy. Prince Edward divided his men into three divisions, the first led by the Earls of Warwick and Suffolk, the second by himself, and the third by Salisbury and Oxford. The French were divided into four divisions, one behind the other, and therefore lost a significant portion of their numerical superiority. In front of his first line and on either side of the narrow lane that led to his position, the prince stationed his archers, who were well protected by hedges, and posted a kind of ambush of 300 men-at-arms and 300 mounted archers who were to fall on the flank of the enemy's second battle, commanded by the Dauphin, Charles, Duke of Normandy. At dawn on September 19th, Prince Edward addressed his small force and the battle started. Three hundred selected men-at-arms attempted to ride through the tight path and force the English position, but they were shot down by the archers. A body of Germans and the first division of the army that followed were thrown into confusion, then the English force in ambush struck the second division on the flank, and as it began to waver, the English men-at-arms mounted their horses, which they had kept close by, and charged down the hill, 
The prince kept Chandos by his side, and his buddy served him well in battle. As they prepared to charge, he yelled out, John, get forward. You will not see me turn my back this day, but I will always be with the front. And then he cried to his banner bearer, Banner, advance in the name of God and St. George. Except for the advance guard, all of the French battled on foot, and the Duke of Normandy's regiment, already weakened, was unable to withstand the English onslaught and fled in chaos. The following division, led by Philip, Duke of Orleans, fled as well, albeit less cruelly, while the rear, led by King John II himself, fought valiantly. The heir to the throne, who had the courage of a lion, took great delight that day in the fight. The fighting raged until just after 3 p.m., and the French, who were completely vanquished, left 11,000 dead on the field, including 2,426 men of gentle origin, nearly a hundred counts, Barons, bannerets, and 2,000 men-at-arms, among many others, were imprisoned, including the king and his youngest son, Philip. English losses were not significant. When King John II was brought to him, the prince greeted him with dignity, assisted him in taking off his armor, and entertained him and the majority of the princes and barons who had been imprisoned at supper. He served at the king's table but refused to sit down with him, stating that he was not worthy to sit at the meal with such a magnificent king or such a brave man, and he spoke many comforting things to him, for which the French applauded him highly. The following day, the black prince began his retreat from Bordeaux. He marched cautiously, but no one dared to confront him. Prince Edward was greeted with great joy when he arrived in Bordeaux on October 2nd, and he and his army stayed there through the winter, wasting the enormous spoil they had gathered on festivities. On March 23, 1357, the prince signed a two-year truce because he wanted to return home. The Gascon nobles were opposed to King John II's deportation to England, so the prince handed them a hundred thousand crowns to quell their protests. He left the nation under the administration of four Gascon lords and arrived in England on May 4th, following an eleven-day sail, landing at Plymouth. When his prisoner, King John II, entered London triumphantly on May 24th, he rode a splendid white charger while mounted on a little black hackney. According to modern conceptions, the prince's display of humility seemed forced, and the Florentine chronicler adds that the honor done to King John II must have deepened the agony of the captive while magnifying King Edward's splendor. However, this observation argues for a level of emotional sophistication that neither English nor Frenchmen had acquired at the time. England, Tournaments and Debts After returning to England, Prince Edward participated in his father's court's many festivals and tournaments, and in May 1359, he, the king, and other challengers held the lists at a joust proclaimed in London by the mayor and sheriffs and, much to the delight of the citizens, the king appeared as mayor and the prince as senior sheriff. Such celebrations, as well as the extravagant presents he spent on his friends, left him in debt, and on August 27th, while a new expedition into France was being readied, the monarch agreed that if he died, his executors would have complete control over his estate for four years in order to pay his debts. The Reims Campaign in October 1359, Prince Edward traveled to Calais with his father and headed an army division during the Reims campaign, 1359-1360. At the end, he played the primary role on the English side in negotiating the Treaty of Bretigny and the preliminary ceasefire agreed at Chartres on May 7, 1360, was drawn out by proctors acting in his person and the name of Charles, Duke of Normandy, the Regent of France. 
He most likely did not return to England until after his father, who arrived at Rye on May 18th. On July 9th, he and Henry, Duke of Lancaster, arrived at Calais to see the French monarch. However, because the promised installment of the king's ransom was not ready, he returned to England, leaving King John in the care of Sir Walter Manny and three other knights. On October 9th, he joined his father to Calais to assist with King John's release and treaty ratification. He traveled with John to Boulogne, where he made his offering in the Church of the Virgin. He and King Edward returned to England in early November, marriage to Joan. On October 10, 1361, the prince, now in his 31st year, married his cousin Joan, Countess of Kent, daughter of Edmund of Woodstock. Earl of Kent, younger son of Edward I and Margaret, daughter of Philip III of France and widow of Thomas Lord Holland, and in the right of his wife, Earl of Kent, who was 33 years old and the mother of three children. Because the prince and the countess were related in the third degree as well as through the spiritual tie of sponsorship with the prince serving as godfather to Joan's elder son Thomas, Pope Innocent VI granted a dispensation for their marriage, though they appear to have been contracted before it was requested. Simon Islip, Archbishop of Canterbury, performed the marriage at Windsor in the presence of King Edward III. According to Jean Froissart, the contract of marriage engagement was entered. The king was unaware of this. The prince and his wife lived at Berkhamsted Castle in Hertfordshire and possessed the manor of Princes Risborough since 1343. While local legend characterizes the place as his palace, several sources say it was more of a hunting lodge. The Prince of Aquitaine and Gascony Edward is handed Aquitaine by his father, King Edward III. Cotton MS Nero D6 F.31 holds the initial letter E of a miniature from 1390. On July 19, 1362, his father, Edward III, handed Prince Edward all of his dominions in Aquitaine and Gascony to be held as a principality by liege homage for an ounce of gold per year, along with the title of Prince of Aquitaine and Gascony. During the rest of the year, he was preoccupied with preparing for his departure to his new principality. After Christmas, he received the king and his court at Berkhamsted, bid farewell to his father and mother, and sailed for Gascony with his wife, Joan, and all his household in February, arriving at La Rochelle. The prince was met at La Rochelle by John Chandos, the king's lieutenant, who took him to Poitiers, where he received the homage of the lords of Poitou and Saint-Ange. He then rode to various cities before arriving in Bordeaux, where he received the homage of the lords of Gascony from July 9th to July 30th. He treated everyone generously and maintained a wonderful court, dwelling alternately in Bordeaux and Angoulême. The prince nominated Chandos as constable of Guienne and gave lucrative positions for his household knights. They maintained a large state and the people were dissatisfied with their extravagant lifestyle. Many of the Gascon lords were displeased with being subjected to English domination and the prince's favoritism toward his own countrymen as well as the showy magnificence they displayed exacerbated their displeasure. Arnaud Amenu, Lord of Albret, and many others were always willing to lend their support to the French cause, while Gaston, Count of Foy, though he visited the prince on his first arrival, was fully French in heart, and caused some controversy in 1365 by refusing to pay tribute to Bern. Charles V, who ascended to the French throne in April 1364, was cautious not to foster the discontents, and the prince's position was far from easy. In April 1363, the prince served as a mediator between the counts of Foy and Armagnac, who had been at odds for some time. 
In the following February, he attempted to negotiate between Charles of Blois and John of Montfort, two rivals for the Duchy of Brittany. Both appeared before him at Poitiers, but his mediation was fruitless. The following month, in May 1363, the prince hosted Peter, king of Cyprus, and held a tournament in Angoulême. At the same time, he and his lords excused themselves from carrying the cross. During the summer, the lord of Albret was in Paris, and his men, together with numerous other Gascon lords, defended the French cause in Normandy against the Navarre faction. Meanwhile, fighting erupted in Brittany, the prince allowed Chandos to recruit and lead a force to support Montfort's side, and Chandos defeated the French at the Battle of Ori, September 29, 1364. As the leaders of the free companies that desolated France were primarily Englishmen or Gascons, they did not destroy Aquitaine, and the prince was suspected, perhaps not without cause, of encouraging, or at least of making no effort to dissuade their activities. As a result, on November 14, 1364, Edward III requested that he curb their ravages. Spanish Campaign 1365 to 67 In 1365 the free companies led by Sir Hugh Cavalier and others joined Bertrand du Guesclin who used them in 1366 to force King Peter of Castile to quit his country and install his bastard brother Henry of Trastamara as king in his place Peter, who was in partnership with Edward III, dispatched messengers to Prince Edward requesting his assistance, and after obtaining a polite response at Corona went out immediately, arriving at Bayonne with his son and three daughters. The prince met him in Cap Breton. I rode with him to Bordeaux. Many of the prince's lords, both English and Gascon, were opposed to him supporting Peter's cause, but he declared that it was not fitting for a bastard to inherit a kingdom or drive out his lawfully born brother, and that no king or king's son should suffer such disrespect to royalty. Nothing could deter him from his determination to restore the king. Peter made friends by announcing that he would name Edward's son king of Galicia and distribute his wealth among those who assisted him. A parliament was held in Bordeaux and it was determined to seek the views of the English king. Edward agreed that his son should assist Peter and the prince convened another parliament during which the king's letter was read. The lords then agreed to lend their assistance in exchange for a guaranteed payment. To provide the necessary security, the prince agreed to lend Peter whatever amount was required. The prince and Peter then met with Charles of Navarre in Bayonne and agreed to allow their men to pass through his territory. To persuade him to do so, Peter was required to pay him 56,000 florins in addition to other grants, which the prince lent him. On September 23rd, a series of agreements, the Treaty of Liborne, were struck into between the Prince, Peter, and Charles of Navarre made a covenant at Liborne on the Dordogne, in which Peter promised to give the Prince the province of Biscay as well as the territory and fortress of Castro de Erdiels as pledges for the repayment of this debt and to pay 550,000 florins for six months' wages at specified dates, with 250,000 florins going to the prince and 800,000 going to the lords serving in the expedition. He agreed to place his three daughters in the prince's hands as hostages for the fulfillment of these agreements, and he also agreed that any time the king the prince, or their heirs, the king of England, march in person against the Moors. They should command the vanguard before all other Christian rulers, and if they are not there, the king of England's banner should be carried alongside the banner of Castile. 
The prince received a hundred thousand francs from his father out of the ransom of John II, the late king of France, and broke up his plate to aid to pay the men he was taking into his pay. While his army was assembling, he remained in Angoulême and was visited by Peter. He then spent Christmas in Bordeaux where his wife, Joan, gave birth to their second son, Richard, the next king of England. Prince Edward departed Bordeaux early in February 1367 and joined his army at Dax, where he stayed for three days until receiving a reinforcement of 400 men-at-arms and 400 archers sent out by his father's brother John, Duke of Lancaster. The prince traveled from Dax to Pamplona, the capital of the Kingdom of Navarre, passing through St. Jean Pie de Port and Roncesvalles in the Pyrenees. When Cavalier and other English and Gascon Free Company commanders discovered that Prince Edward was about to battle for Peter, they abandoned Henry of Trastamara's service and joined Prince Edward because he was their natural lord while in Pamplona. The prince received a letter of defiance from Henry. The prince marched from Pamplona via Aruas to Salvadiera, which opened its gates to his troops, and then to Vitoria, expecting to march directly on Burgos. Sir William Felton's reconnoiter party was defeated by a skirmishing party. Henry had occupied strong positions, including Santo Domingo de la Calzada on the right of the river Ebro and Zaldieran Mountain on the left, preventing him from reaching Burgos through Alava. He crossed the Ebro and camped behind the walls of Legrano. During these moves, the prince's army suffered from a lack of provisions, both for soldiers and horses, dot, and from rainy and windy conditions. Provisions were still scarce in Legrano, although the situation was slightly improved. On March 30, 1367, the prince wrote an answer to Henry's letter. On April 2, he moved from Legrano to Navarrete, La Rioja. Meanwhile, Henry and his French allies had set up camp in Nahara, bringing the two armies close together. Henry and the prince exchanged letters as Henry appeared eager to reach an agreement. He claimed that Peter was a dictator who had killed many innocent people, to which the prince responded that the king had told him that all those he had killed were traitors. On the morning of April 3rd, the prince's army marched from Navarrete, dismounting while still some distance from Henry's army. Lancaster, Chandos, Cavalier, and Clisson led the vanguard of 3,000 men-at-arms, both English and Bretons. The right division was commanded by Armagnac and other Gascon lords, the left, in which some German mercenaries marched with the Gascons, by Jean, Captal de Buck, and the Count of Foy, and the rear or main battle by the prince with 3,000 lances, and with the prince was Peter and, a little on his right, the dethroned James of Majorca. Before the battle of Nehera began, the prince prayed aloud to God that he would be successful in upholding the right and reinstating a disinherited king. Then, after informing Peter that he would know whether or not he would have his kingdom that day, he cried, Advance, banner, in the name of God and St. George, and God defend our right. The knights of Castile assaulted and pressed the English vanguard, but the wings of Henry's army remained still, allowing the Gascon lords to attack the main body on the sides. Then the prince brought the whole body of his army into action and the fighting got severe, for he had the flower of chivalry and the most famous warriors in the whole world. Henry's vanguard eventually gave way and he fled the field. After the battle, the prince urged Peter to spare the lives of those who had offended him. Peter agreed, with the exception of one infamous traitor, whom he immediately executed, he also executed two others the following day. 
Among the detainees was the French Marshal Arnoul d'Audrium whom the prince had previously imprisoned in Poitiers and had released after d'Audrium promised not to fight the prince until his ransom was paid. When the prince saw him he reproached him harshly and addressed him as liar and traitor. Daudrium denied being either, and the prince asked whether he would submit to the decision of a group of knights. To this, Daudrium agreed, and after dinner, the prince appointed twelve knights, four English, four Gascons, and four Bretons, to decide between himself and the marshal. After stating his argument, Diodrium said that he had not breached his commitment because the prince's army was not his own, he was only paid by Peter. The knights agreed with this assessment of the prince's stance and voted in favor of Diodrium. On April 5, 1367, the prince and Peter marched to Burgos to celebrate Easter. The prince, on the other hand, stayed outside the city walls at the monastery of Las Huelgas rather than taking up residence within it. Peter refused to pay him any of the money he owed him, and the prince could only obtain a formal renewal of his pledge of the previous September 23rd, which he performed on May 2nd, 1367, before the high altar of the Cathedral of Burgos. By this point, the prince had begun to suspect his ally of betrayal. Peter had no intention of repaying his debts, and when the prince requested ownership of Biscay, he informed him that the Biscayans would not pass it over to him. To get rid of his debt, Peter told him that he couldn't collect money in Burgos and persuaded the prince to stay in Valladolid while he went to Seville, from whence he promised to transfer the money he owed. Prince Edward remained in Valladolid during some extremely hot weather, waiting in vain for his money. His army was ravaged by dysentery and other ailments, and it is said that just one out of every five Englishmen ever returned to England. He was afflicted with a disease from which he never fully recovered, which some claimed was induced by poison. Food and drink were scarce, and the free businesses in his pay wreaked havoc on the surrounding countryside. Meanwhile, Henry of Trastamara declared war on Aquitaine, seizing Bagners and destroying the country. Fearing that Charles of Navarre would not allow him to return through his territories, the prince negotiated with King Peter IV of Aragon for a passage for his forces. Peter IV established a deal with him, and when Charles of Navarre learned of it, he agreed to let the prince, the Duke of Lancaster, and some of their lords pass through his realm. So they returned via Roncesvalles and arrived in Bordeaux early in September 1367. War in Aquitaine, 1366-70 Sometime after he returned to Aquitaine, the free companies, numbering over 6,000, arrived after passing through the kingdom of Aragon. They took up residence in his kingdom and began to cause havoc because they had not gotten the full amount of money agreed upon by the prince. He convinced the commanders to abandon Aquitaine and the companies under their leadership crossed the Loire, causing significant damage to France. This infuriated Charles V, who at the moment was causing major problems for the prince by promoting disaffection among the Gascon lords. When the prince was assembling his army for his Spanish mission, the Lord of Albrecht consented to supply a thousand lances. Given that he had as many men as he could locate provisions for, on December 8th, 1366, the prince wrote to him and requested that he bring only 200 lances. The Lord of Albret was enraged by this, and even though his uncle, the Count of Armagnac, made peace, he did not forget the offense, which Froissart describes as the first cause of hatred between him and the prince. A more powerful source of resentment for this lord was the failure to pay a yearly stipend granted to him by Edward. Around this time he agreed to marry Margaret of Bourbon, the Queen of France's sister. 
The Black Prince was irritated by this betrothal and his anger was doubtless exacerbated by illness and disappointment. He was harsh to both Dalbret and his intended bride. On the other hand, Charles offered the Lord the pension that he had lost, bringing him and his uncle, the Count of Armagnac, completely over to the French side. The prince's financial woes had been caused by the enormous expense of the late campaign and his persistent luxury, and as soon as he returned to Bordeaux, he convened an assembly of the Estates of Aquitaine Parliament at saint Emilion to demand a gift from them. It appears that no business was done then, for in January 1368, he summoned a meeting of the estates in Angoulême and persuaded them to allow him a foage or hearth tax dot of ten sous over five years. The order for this tax was issued on January 25, 1368. Bishop John Harewell, the Chancellor, held a conference at Nur and persuaded the barons of Poitou, Saint-Ange, Lamousin, and Rurg to agree to this tax, but the great vassals of the High Marches refused. And on June 20th and again on October 25th, the Counts of Armagnac, Perigord, and Cominges, as well as the Lord of Albret, filed complaints before the King of France, declaring that he was their Lord Paramount. Meanwhile, the Prince's friend Chandos, who had firmly advised him against imposing the levy, had retired to his Norman estate. Charles took advantage of these pleas and, on January 25, 1369, dispatched messengers to Prince Edward who was then living in Bordeaux, inviting him to appear in person before him in Paris and receive sentence. Then he said, We will willingly attend at Paris on the day appointed since the King of France sends for us, but it shall be with our helmet on our head and sixty thousand men in our company. Prince Edward imprisoned the messengers, and in retaliation, the Counts of Perigord and Cominges, as well as other lords, attacked Sir Thomas Wake, the high steward of Verurg, killing many of his men and fleeing. The prince summoned Chandos, who assisted him, and some combat ensued, despite the fact that war had not yet been declared. His health had deteriorated to the point where he could no longer participate in active operations due to dropsy and his inability to ride. By March 18, 1367, almost 900 towns, castles, and other sites had signaled their support for the French cause in some form. Prince Edward had already warned his father of the French king's plans, but there was clearly a faction at Edward's court that was jealous of his position and his warnings were ignored. In April 1369, however, war was declared. Edward dispatched the earls of Cambridge and Pembroke to his aid. Sir Robert Knowles, who had rejoined him in duty, contributed significantly to his strength. The war in Aquitaine was futile, and while the English held their ground reasonably on the battlefield, each day that it lasted reduced their grip on the province. On January 1, 1370, Prince Edward suffered a significant loss with the death of his buddy Chandos. Edward made several unsuccessful attempts to reconcile the Gascon lords, which can only have contributed to diminish the prince's authority. It is likely that John of Gaunt was working against him at the English court, and when he was sent abroad in the summer to assist his elder brother, in the spring, Charles summoned two armies to invade Aquitaine, one led by Louis I, Duke of Anjou, to enter Guienne via La Riole and Bergerac, and the other led by John, Duke of Berry, to march towards Limousin and Corsi. Both armies were to unite and besiege the prince in Angoulême. Despite his illness, the prince gathered an army at cities which was betrayed to them by the bishop Jean de Murat de Cross, who had been one of the prince's trusted confidants. The Siege of Limoges, 1370 When Prince Edward learned of Limoges' surrender to the French, he pledged, 
by the soul of his father that he would reclaim the city and punish the residents severely for their betrayal. He headed out from Cognac with an army of approximately 4,000 troops. Due to his illness, he was unable to ride his horse and was carried in a litter. During the siege of Lamoche, the prince was determined to conquer the town and ordered the destruction of its fortifications. On September 19th, his miners succeeded in dismantling a major section of wall, filling the ditches with its remains. The town was then stormed, resulting in destruction and loss of life. The Victorian historian William Hunt, author of Prince Edward's biography in the Dictionary of National Biography, 1889, relying on Froissart as a source, wrote that when the bishop, who was the most responsible for the surrender, was brought before the prince, the prince told him that his head should be cut off. Lancaster persuaded him not to carry out the deed, but that the city was nonetheless pillaged and burnt, and that three thousand people of all ranks and ages were, however, current. Scholarship, including historian Richard Barber's 2008 article in the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography and drawing on a broader range of data, places casualties significantly lower than Froissart did, at roughly 300 garrison soldiers and civilians in all. The prince returned to Cognac. His illness worsened and he was compelled to abandon any hope of being able to direct any more operations and travel first to Angoulême, then to Bordeaux, England. Edward's eldest son, Edward of Angoulême, died in 1371, which caused him tremendous pain. His health continued to deteriorate, so the prince's personal doctor recommended him to return to England. Edward departed Aquitaine with the Duke of Lancaster and arrived in Southampton early in January 1371. Edward met his father in Windsor. At this encounter, Prince Edward intervened to prevent Edward III from signing a pact with Charles of Navarre the previous month because he refused to give the territory desired by King Charles. Following that, the Black Prince returned to his manor in Berkhamsted. When he returned to England, the Prince was probably recognized as the natural opponent of the influence wielded by the anti-clerical and Lancastrian parties, and it is clear that the clergy trusted him. For on May 2nd, he met the convocation of Canterbury at the Savoy and persuaded them to make an exceptionally large grant. His health began to improve, and in August 1372 he went with his father to Thur's assistance, but the fleet was never able to reach the French shore due to adverse winds. On October 6th, he resigned as principal of Aquitaine and Gascony, citing insufficient earnings to fulfill expenses, and acknowledged his departure in Parliament the following month. At the end of the session, after the knights had been dismissed, he met with the citizens and burgesses in a room near the White Chamber, and persuaded them to extend the duties granted the previous year to protect merchant trade for another year. It is reported that after Whitsunday, May 20th, 1374, the prince presided over a council of prelates and nobles gathered at Westminster to respond to Pope Gregory She's request for a subsidy to assist him against the Florentines. After hearing the Pope's letter, which claimed his right as ruler spiritual and, by the grant of John, Lord-in-Chief of the realm, the bishop stated that he was Lord of all. The crown's cause, however, was strongly pursued and the prince, irritated by Archbishop Whittlesey's hesitancy, talked severely to him, finally telling him that he was an ass. The bishops gave way and it was decided that John lacked the authority to subjugate the realm. The prince's illness returned in force, but when the good parliament met on April 28, 1376, he was regarded as the chief support of the commons in their attack on the abuses of the administration. 
and he evidently acted in concert with William of Wycombe in opposing Lancaster's influence and the disreputable clique of courtiers who upheld it, and he had good reason to fear that his brother's power would jeopardize his son Richard's chances. Richard Lyons, the king's financial agent, who was impeached for massive fraud, sent him a £1,000 bribe and other gifts. However, he declined to accept it, later saying that it was a shame he had not retained it and sent it to pay the warriors fighting for the kingdom. Death Edward's Grave at Canterbury Cathedral Edward was aware of his impending death since the good parliament. His dysentery had grown so severe on times, leading him to faint from weakness that his family assumed he had died. B. In his testament, he left gifts for his servants and bid his father, Edward III, farewell, requesting that he confirm his gifts, pay his obligations immediately from his inheritance, and safeguard his son Richard. His death was announced at the Palace of Westminster on June 8, 1376. In his final hours, he was attended by the Bishop of Bangor, who implored him to seek forgiveness from God and all those he had wronged. He made a very noble end, remembering God his Creator in his heart, and requested that others pray for him. On September 29th, Edward was buried in Canterbury Cathedral in grand style. His burial and tomb were planned in accordance with his will. It has a bronze figure beneath the tester portraying the Holy Trinity with his heraldic achievements, his surcoat, helmet, shield, and gauntlets hung over the tester. They have been replaced by copies. And the originals are currently housed in a glass-fronted cabinet inside the cathedral. His epitaph written around his effigy reads, the genuine heraldic achievements of Prince Edward are on display at Canterbury Cathedral. As I am, so shall you be. I didn't think much about death as long as I could enjoy my breath. On earth I had abundant wealth, including land, houses, treasure, horses, money, and gold. But now I am a wretched captive, deep in the ground, here I lie. My formerly magnificent beauty is now gone, and my flesh has turned to bone. So friends, before you go, please let us know that we have made this video on the history with great effort. Tell us how you liked it in the comments below, and connect with us by subscribing to our channel and pressing the bell button. Do it! If you want to know about any history, you can definitely give us ideas in the comments below. Next time we will make a video according to you.